information. Cool, excellent. Okay, so tonight's web webinar, we're looking at good data management and what that means um, in your role with the Woodcraft Rake. Um, I'm Pippa Gardner. Um, I am a project coordinator on a new group's project and also a communications manager for Woodcraft Folk. Um, can everyone see the slides? Either unmute yourself and say or just type into the chat box. Excellent, cool. So tonight's webinar um, is going to cover, um, firstly, looking at data protection principles. So what are the underpinning principles behind how we treat data and keep it safe? And then we're going to move on to look at uh, what that means in terms of what data we can collect and how it can be used, uh, applying those principles in practice. A little bit of how those um, principles apply um, to information and data around accidents and incidents, uh, around images, and then around uh, particularly time periods and methods for storing, accessing, sharing, and destroying data. And we'll just finish up with some top tips and then we'll have a chance for any questions at the end of the webinar. If you have any as we go along, feel free to type it into the chat box um, and I'll keep an eye on that and come to them um, at suitable points uh, in the presentation. So data protection principles, these are informed by um, national data protection principles. So you might have heard the um, acronym GDPR over the last year. That's a new piece of data protection legislation um, that is a subtle change um, to what existed previously um, and tells us kind of what we can do with data in the context of um, the UK uh, law. Uh, and policy environment. So those have been interpreted to inform Woodcroft folks' data protection policy. Um, and we interpret those principles uh, in terms of five different things. So if we don't use it, we don't collect it. If we no longer need it, we delete it. Individuals should be giving their consent for their data to be held. And individuals should be informed on how their data will be held and used by Woodcroft folk. And only those who need access should have access. So we'll get into a little bit of how that relates um, specifically to different uh, scenarios and contexts. Um, but overall, the information around uh, data protection, if you ever need to refer back to it, is at the um, URL on this slide. So forward slash resources forward slash data protection hub. That's where you can find um, the information um, behind tonight's webinar and the policies, uh, if you ever need to refer to it. So what data should be collected? As we said in our principles, it's, it's important that we are only collecting the data that we need. And in the context of what we do, that's the data we need to run our groups and activities um, safely, um, safely, inclusively, um, and appropriately. So there might be data um, that you could collect, but if you don't need it in the context of those activities, um, we shouldn't be collecting and storing it. There might be data we collected previously that you've realized that you don't need. And so we need to start applying um, these principles and um, deleting it from our records. On um, the table to the right of this slide, it details the kind of data that you should be collecting um, and data that is deemed to be personal data or sensitive data. And these are two categories of how we treat data um, based on that piece of GDPR uh, legislation. So for children and young people who are actively involved in the group, we'll be holding um, personal data in terms of their name, their date of birth, their address, contact details for um, their parent or carer, um, and an emergency contact if that's any different and um, their own mobile number, if that is a child or young person who is allowed to make their own way to the group so that there is um, ways to get in uh, communication with them. In addition, there might be sensitive data that you'd hold, such as medical and health information around 
any disabilities, allergies, uh, medicines they might be taking and who their um, GP or consultant might be for any ongoing health conditions. This is all data that would help us to run our activities um, safely um, and would be expected to be collected as part of a registration um, process with the group. So connected to that for parents and carers of children and young people actively involved in the group, we don't need any sensitive data from them, but we do need their personal data of name, address and contact details, because that relates to their um, children and young people participating in our activities. And then for volunteers who are helping to run the group, we also need to have sensitive information about their medical and health information. We also need to be collecting as part of our safeguarding processes um, their DBS status and their membership status. Um, as it says in the, the footnote on this one, we need their DBS status um, in relation to when they join the organisation and when it is um, updated every three years. Um, but we won't be holding a copy of that DBS um, certificate. Um, we don't need the information within that other than at the point of making the decision of whether they become or continue to be members. Again, we'll also have personal data for them, such as their name, uh, date of birth, address and contact details, um, which again helps us to keep in communication with them um, and at various points do things like verify their identity um, in part of the recruitment process. And then the other kind of group of people that we will hold data for are children and young people on our waiting list. So they're on our waiting list, so they're not actively participating in the groups. So at that point, we don't need any of that sensitive data um, around medical or health information. But we do need those uh, bits of information that help us to get in contact with them where there is space and they can join their group, such as their name, date of birth, address, and the contact details for their parent or carer. So that's the data that we will collect. And then that data can be only used in a particular ways. And it'd be used in the ways that we need to, again, to ensure our um, group nights, uh, other activities are running um, safely. So it allows us to communicate effectively with all of those involved in the group. It might be with the young people themselves or um, with their parents and carers, depending on the age group. <coughs> Sorry. And um, in order to be, for us to be able to use that data, we need to make sure that we have consent um, and informed consent um, from the young people and from their parents about what we are collecting and how it's going to be used, um, particularly around sensitive data. Um, so enabling them to understand that sensitive data enables us to make sure activities are inclusive uh, that they meet the needs of the members of the group and um, that it's tailored to to those who want to take part and yeah, is appropriate to their to their needs. Um, if we didn't have an individual's phone number or email address, we'd find it much harder to inform them about uh, planned group activities or any camps. Um, and if we didn't have knowledge of an individual's allergies or support needs um, that might uh, cause a medical emergency um, or fail to enable them to participate kind of appropriately, appropriately in group activities in camps. So it's just about making um, individuals aware when we're collecting that data what it's going to be used for um, and why we need to hold that data. So at a group night it would be expected that all groups should maintain a register of participants. So that's children, young people, um, adult volunteers with the group and any guests attending. So that is a register that just records their, their name and their dates of attendance. Um, depending on your venue and your pickup arrangements um, and the age of the children to take part, that might need to be also a register that registers when they arrive and when they depart. Um, some venues, it might be easy to do that by eye, you know when they're leaving. Other more outdoor venues, um, making sure people register in and register out um, enables you to keep a more 
accurate record um, to ensure the safety um, of the activity and of the young people. At a group night, you also want to have access to emergency contact details in case of any emergencies, uh, medical information and support needs um, if you are responding to any um, incident that might arise or if um, you have, when an incident does arrive, being able to pass on that information to any um, paramedics as appropriate. <coughs> so group leaders will have access to personal sensitive data about all of the children and young people participating. Um, but that data can be held electronically or in hard copy um, and should only be used by those adults responsible for running the group. Um, so it might be, if your venue uh, allows, it might be held in an electronic device that you know you can get access to it where you need to. In most cases, you will need some of that data in hard copy to ensure that it's to hand when you need it. Between group nights, um, data should only be stored at the venue if it can be done securely in a locked cupboard. It shouldn't be in a shared cupboard where those unconnected to the group might be able to access that data um, without your knowledge. Sorry, my slides are skipping. So on camp. So in addition to the information needed for a group night, leaders on a camp will also need information about uh, an individual's dietary requirements. Um, that might be appropriate on group night if you do things uh, like a snack or have a longer meeting where there's uh, or food is involved in the activity. Um, but you would definitely need dietary requirements um, at camp. You also want to collect a second emergency uh, contact um, when staying away overnight. And then once that data is collected, it will be shared with volunteers based on their individual role um, within the event. So, for example, a KP who's in charge of um, cooking would need dietary information and any relevant medical data um, to prepare it to, as relates to preparing food. Whereas the first aider would need medical information and details of an individual's doctor. Um, in case they needed to pass those on in case of an emergency. And then a clan leader and camp coordinator would need access to emergency contact information. If you are producing that data on paper to take it away to camp to make sure it's to hand, um, it should be destroyed within 48 hours of returning from the camp. It shouldn't be kept um, Can you hear me? Can people hear me now? Uh, yes, that's much better. You can hear me now, okay. Emily, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, where did we get to before I disappeared?
you had just started to talk about um, instant forms, I think. OK. We will go back a slide then. OK, so accidents and instants. I'll recap this uh, in case it wasn't captured on the recording. So in contrast to what we said on the previous slide about uh, destroying data within 48 hours of returning from camp, accident and incident forms are the exception and they need to be kept for a minimum of three years. And these should be kept alongside the registration forms for those individuals involved. So they're kept alongside other, other personal contact information detailing who the individual is. We keep those to uh, enable Woodcroft folk to review practice so that we might learn lessons and produce, uh, prevent future incidents. Um, but they may also be required to support any um, insurance claim or legal process following the, following the incident or accident. So it's really important that those are kept um, for at least that time period and not destroyed um, within 48 hours of camp. So now we're going to move on to talk about image consent um, and images of people are data, even though it's not quite the same as uh, a date of birth or an address. Um, images are capturing people's um, personal information, um, particularly about where they are and perhaps identifiable on a certain time or date. So for our young members and our volunteers, we should be asking for image consent uh, as part of that registration um, process with a group. Um, <coughs> and that is um, making sure that those who can't be photographed for any reason, um, we are aware of that and we are making sure that we are not capturing them any photographs um, that might put them in a, a situation that they don't want to be in um, and that all members are informed of how those photographs um, are going to be used. Um, so the template registration form that you can find um, on the Woodcroft Folk website details um, a few different um, cases of how that those images might be used and it's important to have that level of informed consent that people know how their photographs might be used um, as well as allowing them to be taken. Um, when we're taking images at events um, such as taster events where not everybody participating will be members, um, um, we don't have that registration process to capture consent. Um, we still need to take certain steps to make sure that we are trying to inform people and getting um, their consent to have their photographs taken. So one, one of the ways to do this is to display a sign um, quite obviously that photographs will be taken um, and to ask individuals to identify themselves if they do not wish for their image to be used or you might just want to take a couple of photographs to give a sense of the activity where you have got specific verbal permission from the people who feature in those photographs. Wherever possible um, we can try and take group or activity photos that show a sense of the activity but which obscure faces. So it might be a photo from behind or a more close-up photo where you wouldn't be able to identify the, the child in particular taking part. Um, or we can ask individuals to sign a photo consent form, um, again to get specific permission um, if we're taking photographs that do feature um, quite obviously a particular uh, individual. So after we've taken the photos, we are obviously also storing them um, and we want to store them in a way that um, will help us if at any point an individual wants to remove their permission, um, they have the right to do so and ask us to no longer use that photograph. Um, and if that happens, it is much easier um, if we've kept a certain amount of what we call metadata alongside that image. It will help us find the right ones um, in order to kind of delete them from the images we hold. So if we can, we need to record who is in the photo, where it was taken, when it was taken, and how image consent um, was held or recorded. Um, is it in a registration form? Is it in an event consent form? Was it taken verbally um, on the day? 
And without that information, it can be a very time consuming process to try and identify any images with an individual um, in them. Um, so once an individual asks their image to no longer be used, um, we will be deleting that um, from a, a national point of view. We would delete it from our online gallery and from our electronic files. Um, if that request comes into a group or district, you need to be also deleting it from anywhere you might have posted it or shared it, as well as your offline store of those images. Um, however, our policy is that if the image has been used uh, in a print publication, we will replace the image when the publication is next due for reprint, um, but would not be able to destroy or recall um, any new printed material that was already um, in circulation. So now thinking about communication. So one of the main reasons that we collect and store um, data uh, is particularly to be able to communicate with other people. Um, we hold that data only for the purposes of um, being able to carry out woodcraft folk activities. So we should only be communicating um, with our group members and their parents about woodcraft folk matters. So about program information, about camps, events, or news that specifically relates to the group. We might choose to share third party information and items of interest through social media channels that people have opted in to follow, but we shouldn't be sending it by direct email to people's inboxes because that is not information that they've necessarily opted in um, to receive. Whenever we're sending emails or texts um, to individuals, we want to make sure that we're using the BCC function, which stands for blind carbon copy, which means that everyone um, receives the same email at the same time, but they can't see the other recipients of it. And that just ensures we're not sharing individuals' email addresses or phone numbers unnecessarily with people that they haven't given their consent for them to receive. If you are part of um, a team or a group of volunteers who work together, you might have a conversation and decide that it is most appropriate for you to all be able to see each other's email in a group chain. But for that to happen, you need to have had consent for those email addresses to, and all phone numbers to be shared amongst all of the recipients within that group. So to think about storing information, data relating to children, young people and their parents can be stored in paper copy or electronically, but whichever way is being used, it should be done securely. So that paper copy needs to be um, either locked in a cupboard at your group night venue or kept securely um, by one of the volunteers between group nights, if it's in hard copy. Electronically, you need to make sure that's in a password protected um, software or platform to ensure that only the people um, who you give permission to can access that information. Data relating to adult members um, should be accessed through the membership database and shouldn't need to be held um, separately except for um, communication um, details and uh, kind of emergency contacts that you might need for a particular activity, but it doesn't need to be held on an ongoing basis. So if continuing to think about storage, how long should it be kept? So for those who are currently actively involved, we have a uh, reason to be holding their information. So any members, any beneficiaries, and any parents or guardians of beneficiaries uh, will hold their data while they're in membership. And then our policy is to keep that for three years from the end of their membership. For donors and supporters, that's up to seven years from their most recent donation. And then for customers or, or guests of places like of our folk supply or of one of our centers, that will be kept for up to three, uh, three years from their most recent kind of custom, uh, so either, like attendance and event at a center or purchase um, from folk supply. 
The only exceptions to these is data relating to safeguarding incidents or which may be legally required in relation to future safeguarding incidents, which will be kept uh, indefinitely um, because that information um, may be needed over a, a longer time period. So who should have access to the data? Only those who need access to the data to fulfill their, their role with the organisation should have access to it. So group leaders will need to know the names, medical conditions and support needs of children and young people participating in a group. Group contacts will need to have access to the emergency contact details for all group members. And when the group contact is unavailable, that needs to be delegated to another group leader um, in attendance. And then um, a treasurer would need to have access to data relating to gift aid that maybe a group leader doesn't need to know. So around um, opting into to gift aid processes and the, the information that needs to be collected to enable that to happen. Whereas a membership secretary will need to have access to information like volunteer references and referee contact details in processing and fulfilling that um, vetting process and the safeguarding procedures um, when volunteers start. When a volunteer leaves a role, we need to make sure that their access to the data is removed. If that's hard copies, you need to make sure that they have been. Uh, uh, the sound's gone again. OK, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I can still hear you OK, Pippa. OK, excellent. Irene, am I back? I don't think Owen can hear me, but Emily can. I am going to plough on. Um, Emily, let me know if you also can't hear me uh, at any point, because I'm presuming it's recording me if somebody can hear me. Um, so the, what I was saying was when a volunteer leaves the role, access to data needs to be removed. In hard copy, that needs to be collected in um, to make sure that it is passed on to uh, volunteers staying with the group or destroyed, whichever is most appropriate. Um, if storing data electronically, um, it's really useful to use uh, an online cloud-based software, so something like Dropbox or Google Drive, where you can uh, add and remove people's permissions as uh, appropriate so that the current volunteer team um, are the only ones maintaining access to the data. So in terms of sharing data, as an organisation, we will not share data with a third party um, unless there is a child protection or safeguarding concern. So there is no sharing data for other organisations, uh, marketing purposes in particular. We can reassure people that their data is only used for participation in Woodcraft Folk activities and then for um, keeping um, children, young people and adults um, safe in terms of child protection and safeguarding. If we are contracting an external activity instructor, we will then ask members to complete a consent form or an updated health and medical form for that particular activity um, so that they know what data is being then shared with that external provider. And then the final element that we need to make sure we're also doing is destroying data. So once data is no longer needed, it should be destroyed securely. So in terms of uh, hard copy files, that's shredding or burning, um, and then electronic phone is, is making sure that they have been securely uh, deleted from any uh, cloud-based platform or individual electronic devices. And that is based on uh, the time periods outlined in the previous slide. So just to sum up with some top tips, uh, in terms of ensuring 
um, good data management. We need to only ask for personal or sensitive information when we need it. We do not share an individual's personal information with another person or organisation, except for child protection or safeguarding issues. Uh, make sure to use the BCC function, the blind carbon copy, um, or set up an email group where appropriate for communication. We need to make sure we're issuing a data usage statement, um, which sounds uh, maybe a little scary, but that's basically telling people how we use and store the information that we are collecting from them on things like registration forms and health and consent forms. Um, one of our top tips, if you use a shared cloud-based system that is password protected, that can help you make sure the right volunteers uh, and you've kept up to date with who can access that information on an ongoing basis without having to uh, move it um, over time. And then final top tip, dispose of out-of-date personal data securely. Um, so we need to make sure we're fulfilling the whole process and where we have collected data, we need to be um, continuously evaluating, do we still need to have that data and deleting it where appropriate. So that's the end of our webinar this evening. Um, there is the link on this slide, again, for uh, revisiting any of the information and the recording from tonight will be put up online soon so that people can watch back and ask any uh, further questions. But if any of our attendees this evening have any questions, we can have a little bit of time for discussion now. Hello. Um, so I just had a question about the retention schedules and keeping up to date with them. And I wondered if um, any groups have any examples or you know of any examples of good practice in terms of um, maybe scheduling in a month every year to kind of check in on what data, what data each group is keeping and, and um, checking in with a retention schedule or if Woodcraft sends out any reminders as well at certain times of the year to kind of check in with what data you have and um, make sure that you're not going over any retention schedules that have been set. So um, I think most uh, groups, some groups do it on a termly basis. So you use the start of a term as a kind of prompt to look at the information they've got, um, who their current members are, uh, how long it's been since uh, someone was a member, um, and deleting that data as appropriate. Others do it on uh, more of a yearly basis, so either September really being seen as kind of the start of a new academic school year um, to evaluate yeah, who, who's still a member of the group um, or January being the kind of calendar year and being able to then more easily look back at um, any dates on that data to be able to say when was three years in the past. Um, I think the only kind of uh, prompts and reminders around kind of data, um, they come with kind of the registration processes. Um, so I think Owen wants to add to that um, from the text. Um, if you want to pick up from there. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, you've, you've shared exactly the kind of things that I would have said around, around logical times of year to do it. But I think just to say groups should be making sure that they're renewing the contact information and the... Um, you know, health and personal information that they've got on file on an annual basis anyway. So you should be reissuing those um, those consent forms at least annually because everything from a child's GP to uh, their diagnosis to their parent or carer or their mobile number could change over the course of a year um, and people will never remember you doing, you know, to, to let you know. Um, in my groups, we've tended to do that at the start of the academic year in September and that's a really good time when you're going through that process I mean let's be realistic it takes until Christmas for them to all come back um, 
but when you're going through that process that's a really good prompt to go through the what you're holding and go through the file and say right well this is no longer relevant this is timed out this group this child hasn't been here for three years let's get rid of that and that's a really good prompt to do that um i suppose the other thing to say is that each group or district should be reviewing their safeguarding plan um in an ideal world at least annually um, and again that's a really good prompt when you go through that and look at that and look at your practice and update your practice on that whatever time that is in your year when you tend to do that that's a really good prompt to look at that record keeping around around safeguarding and that's a really good time to to think about um updating and and, and doing some housekeeping there cool thank you Aaron. Does that answer the question, Emily, or have you got another question? No, that answered it. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Excellent. Cool. Well, if we haven't got any more questions, I will end the webinar there.